This video is part of a webinar series on Hindu Dvesha, an educational series to explore and expose systemic Hindu phobia. In this webinar, we will be exploring the prevalence of Hindu Dvesha in school textbooks. To unpack this complex subject, we have two prominent speakers in the field, Professor Kundan Singh and Shri Krishna Maheshwari. Professor Kundan Singh is part of the core doctoral faculty with Hindu University of America. He is a scholar of integral yoga. He has done extensive research, has taught and published in a variety of areas pertaining to the philosophy and psychological aspects of Hindu thought system. Our second speaker, Krishna Maheshwari, holds bachelor's and master's degrees from Cornell University in Computer Science and Engineering and MBA from Harvard Business School. He is the founder and CEO of Hindupedia and is deeply engaged in fighting Hindu phobic narrative in school textbooks. Krishna has founded a number of Hindu organizations and is a keenly sought after speaker on the subject of Hindu Dvesha in the Western education system. So, um, you know, the first topic is uh, basically outlining what the problem, you know, with the what the, the textbooks are, and as it is said, that a picture is worth a thousand words. So when you uh, look at the pictures on your screen, you will clearly see that when Hinduism is being spoken about, it is described as a tradition which is uh, exotic. And if you look at uh, the two children who are carrying cow dung on their heads, uh, you will see that the message which is being conveyed is that Hinduism is oppressive. And uh, the two diagonal uh, pictures of the quadrant that you find basically suggest that Hindus uh, are dirty and filthy people, uh, being poor. So these are some of the representations uh, that you find um, in in, in the textbooks. And, uh, you know, the Europeans for a very long period of time, you know, misrepresenting uh, the Hindus, but the Hindu phobia or Hindu dvesha actually became very systematized and institutionalized with the writings of James Mill, who produced uh, three volumes on the history of British India in 1818. And given that uh, James Mill was also a very, very important figure in East India Company, he was actually able to uh, influence the government, governmental policies in India. And India actually had uh, a massive impact because of his writings. Now, uh, James Mill basically wrote seven chapters on Hinduism, and his uh, entire agenda was to describe Hindus and Hinduism as hierarchical and oppressive. And this was done within the context of showing that the Hindus were basically savage and primitive people who had no uh, idea of civilization. And uh, in the last of the, seventh, uh, of, of the seven chapters, you know, these are some of the things that he's, he has spoken about now, the narrative that you find in the textbooks today, they are basically the sanitized version of what was put in place earlier. So, you know, it, nowhere in the text, very clearly you will find written that Hindus are dirty and filthy people. But what they will do is, that they will insert pictures in the text right from the very beginning, which will begin to give the impression that Hindus are lazy, are, 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 
are lazy, filthy, and dirty. And this representation basically begins to have an impact on the children because uh, this sort of a narrative is actually introduced to them at a very, very early age. James Mill is not an individual. James Mill is a tradition. James Mill is a parampara. And this tradition has been continuing for a very long period of time and it has a direct influence on what is being written. You know, when, when Hinduism is basically spoken about, Hinduism is linked with caste. In fact, you know, if you look, look at the sequence of chapters in school textbooks, even before the sublime or the profound ideas of Brahm, yoga, meditation, worship, bhakti, and so on and so forth are introduced, caste is spoken about first. So what these textbooks do is that they begin orienting the students right from the very beginning, or you can say that they start prejudicing the students right from the very beginning. And as the text, you know, moves forward, very, very important concepts like karma and dharma, they are also linked to jati and caste. And I will give you uh, an example here where jati is basically being conflated with karma. This is from McGraw Hill's uh, uh, World History Textbook. Beliefs such as reincarnation also made many Indians more accepting of the jati system. A devout Hindu believed that the people in a higher jati were superior and deserved their status. At the same time, the belief in reincarnation gave hope to people from every walk of life. A person who leads a good life is reborn into a higher jati. Now, you know, this is, this is a very interesting spin. As you would know, you know, the, the idea of karma has been central not only to the Vedantic and Vedic traditions, but also to... Uh, Hinduism and, uh, sorry, uh, Buddhism and Jainism. Now, when, you know, karma is being discussed in the context of Buddhism, there is a different color to it or there is a different spin. But when karma is being used in the context of Hindus and Hinduism, this is the kind of representation that you get. Now, let me come to in one of the chapters, James Mill had devoted considerable time in showing that Hindu governance system was basically oppressive. So there are two examples, you know, that I have taken from the text. Uh, examples of Chandragupta as well as Ashoka. And of course, you know, Chandragupta is described as as the Hindu king. So this is, you know, this is the description of, uh, of Chandragupta. Chandragupta was afraid of being poisoned. So he had servants taste his food before he ate it. He was so concerned about being attacked that he never slept for two nights in a row in the same bed. Now, how is Ashoka, you know, his grandson compared to him? And the comparison basically is not a comparison between the two of them, but it is a comparison between Hinduism and Buddhism, whereas Buddhism is characterized as an emancipatory or a liberatory tradition. So what does the text read? After one battle, Ashoka looked at the fields covered with dead and wounded shoulders, uh, soldiers. He was horrified by what he saw. He decided that he would follow Buddhist teachings and become 
a man of peace. So Ashoka kept his promise. During the rest of his life, he tried to improve the lives of his people. Ashoka made laws that encouraged good deeds, family harmony, non-violence, and toleration of other religions. He created hospitals for people and for animals. He built fine roads with rest houses and shade trees for the traveler's comfort. So basically, you know, in very subtle ways, what the message gets conveyed is that Hinduism is hierarchical and oppressive, whereas Buddhism is emancipatory and liberatory. Now, what is the cause of all this? Um, before Krishna and I jumped into the fray, you know, uh, when this narrative in textbooks uh, was being fought, People were basically fighting the battle on the basis of evidence. And because of our orientation, we could very clearly see that this matter was not about evidence alone and that this battle would not be won on the basis of evidence alone. It's not that, you know, that we are denying uh, evidence or the importance of evidence, but what we also recognized was that this entire narrative was created, crafted, fostered within the framework or paradigm of what is called Orientalism at this point in time. And people who are familiar with Orientalism, you know, will also understand that it was basically racism which has underlined the creation of this narrative. The Western world spends a lot of time, money, and resources to see to it that the discourse does not change. And that discourse is prevalent in universities, books continually get written. The narrative is continually getting refreshed. Now, the resistance, on the other hand, you know, has been very, very weak in the sense that we do not have the infrastructure. You know, we have not been uh, uh, uncovering this problem systematically. We have not been addressing this problem systematically. And when I say this, you know, I mean at the level of community. And it is basically because of this that the uh, problem persists. Um, so when we talk about what the state of this ecosystem is, uh, Kundan, of course, has lived through it. it. He has somehow survived. He's one of the very few professors that have survived in the history social sciences while continuing to do this work. Um, but even in history social sciences, that there's various different domains. It is fairly rare to come across a professor in Indology or in Hinduism that is a practicing Hindu. Um, you've heard of what's happened at Rutgers and Professor Trotsky is not a practicing Hindu. And that is a very, very commonplace thing. Every once in a while, you will run into a professor that is a practicing Hindu and have a conversation with them about their experience. As part of the work we did in California, we reached out to a great many professors to get endorsements for the letters. We needed academic endorsements because our opponents, in a lot of ways, were placed on a pedestal as academics. And in fact, we're presenting the sole academic voice on this. And as the experts, of course, their voices needed to be listened to. We found some professors that were later on in their careers willing to endorse, to the, not to the same number as those were, that were willing to engage against. But we also saw friendly academics that were very supportive of our work and, in fact, would even help behind the scenes, but they didn't want their names associated with it. 
And there were some academics that were also Hindu that were also doing reasonably good work. But they were afraid to exchange emails with us. They were afraid to get on a full, lest they'd get out that their name was involved. And then in hindsight, we thought about why is this fear there to engage, to use your name in public, when the opposition so easily puts their name in public. The 200 number here comes from a letter that was sent to the California State Board where they put their names. And when challenged, some of them admitted they had not even read the letter, but they, they were willing to put their name. But the Hindu community and the Hindu academics were not. And that goes from this ecosystem that directly impacts their career, that impacts their path to getting tenureship at their universities. And so they need to keep their heads down. And their lack of support from the community that, that gives them financial security for their future. So all of these things interplay in terms of the ecosystem, when we talk about this ecosystem. On the other hand, if you're anti-Hindu or willing to produce scholarship that aligns to the James Mill Parampara, you are rewarded. You're rewarded through grants, you're rewarded through tenureship, and so many different ways through the academic ecosystem. We've started to understand this broadly, but we haven't begun to participate in a resistance movement or to fight it. And consequently, when you see academic work done around history and science related to Hinduism, it never comes from the social scientists, social sciences fields. Those professors tend to be science professors, computer science, math, uh, physics, biology, the hard sciences, because their academic career sits outside of this ingrained ecosystem where they're not impacted because it's far away. And their, their career depends on the hard scientists where, sciences where they are somewhat protected based on the quality of the work that they do. So the impact here starts with the children. The examples we gave are horrendous enough when they stand alone, but the reality is they don't stand alone. You spent, by the time you enter the sixth grade in California and the seventh, eighth, ninth, or 10th grade in the rest of the country, as a child, you've heard from your parents Beta, be a good kid, son or daughter, whoever it is, and listen to your teacher. Study those materials. Do well on those tests. Okay, Papa, we'll go do that year after year after year. Now, if you go to them when, when they get to this curriculum, most parents aren't aware, so they don't tell them to not pay attention. And frankly, at that point, if they tell them to pay attention, it doesn't work. The parents are ignored. They've already been brainwashed by their own parents to, to take in what's being given. Um, so, so then they go to the teachers who are teaching about this hateful tradition. But this curriculum isn't on its own either. They've gone through Christianity, Judaism at this point. Islam comes later. But, but by and large, the pictures are amazing. The descriptions are amazing. Why wouldn't you want to be Christian or Judaic coming out of that, especially if you look at the, these, this hateful tradition of Hinduism? And so we start there. However, remember that we're still a small percentage of this country. And so most of the other children are systematically taught racism in parallel. Their traditions are amazing. But then this tradition that one or two kids in your classroom follow is hateful. And so from that perspective, well, it's very natural to bully. You're not even intending to bully, but you do. And of course, the Hindu children are being bullied. And so there's this interplay between the children that are Hindu and non-Hindu in this room in a very painful situation for these kids. What happens? They depart from the tradition. They don't always go home and say, mommy, papa, I don't want to be a Hindu, although we have plenty of examples of that actually happening. Many of them just veer away silently. They'll continue to go to Sunday school, but they won't believe it anymore. If we have a home practice, it gets undone as well. You don't find out about it for years. They go to college. They continue to stay away. They marry. Well, they didn't marry a Hindu, and even if they did, their kids don't end up being practicing Hindus. And in the worst of cases, they support the hateful tradition narrative. 
on the other side, you get shows like CNN's Believer from a couple of years ago. Yeah, the narrator wasn't Hindu, but he wasn't a racist bigot intending to be racist. He was just doing what their experts and scholars say. And yeah, the specific sect can be interesting and, and drive T- TRP. So great, let's do that one. But then he didn't do that for every single mainstream tradition. We were singled out. And I'm willing to bet there were collaborators that are collaborators that were Hindu that were supporting this narrative. How many of us who are outstanding Hindus believe that Buddhism was a reflection or an improvement upon Hinduism? That was brought in the text. I had that debate with one of my son's uh, friend's dad. He says, yes, Hinduism is an improvement. What do you mean it's not? What do you mean it's wrong to teach that it is? And why is that? Well, that's what he had been taught as a kid growing up in India. And so this was very aligned. Now, the conversation ended with a very poignant question that I put to him, which was, I know you believe this. There's nothing I can say that will convince you otherwise. But when did you critically analyze the thing that you were taught? And he paused and he said, never. How many of us fall in that very same category? Dodo Bird's an interesting example. Um, and, and the quote here is from, from a website that, that I didn't attribute, but the European caused the extinction of the Dodo Bird. They lost the ability to fly. They adapted to terrestrial life. The conformation of their body changed and their wings atrophied. There are a lot of parallels here. Yes, the Europeans did not cause the extinction of the Hindus, but we did lose the ability to fly. Think about all the work that was produced before the Europeans and before the Islamic invasions in India. The work continued to be produced while we were fighting Islam in India. But then we adapted to European life. We had the Anglicized Hindus that went to Europe to be trained as civil servants of colonial India. Some of those stayed in positions of power post-independence. We have entire universities full of such scholars today. And the confirmation of our body, the Hindu community, has changed. How many of us have said chalta hai? Or have had friends who said chalta hai? Why fight it? It's too complicated. It's too hard. Our wings have simply atrophied. This is the state of reality. Now, we can choose to not fight it and go completely the way of the dodo bird. Maybe it won't be this generation. Maybe it won't be next generation. Maybe it's in three generations. Maybe it's in four. But who knows? Maybe it will be the first or second. Either way, that's the direction we're headed if as a community we don't decide to wake up and do something different. The fact that... So what did California look like? So, so if we look at what happened in California, there, it starts with something called the history social science standards. Uh, there, that is set up through the California legislature and approved by the California governor. California has the most detailed standards of any state in the U.S. And it has exactly five points. So that level of detail is illustrating, given that that stands above and apart everyone else. Once that is approved, and this was approved a long, long time ago, then you get into something called the California History Social Science Framework. We were engaged in the refinement of this from 2015 to 2016. Then after that, in 2017, is the textbook approval process. And then there's the textbook edits and corrections phase, which which happened from there on through 2020. In this, look at the number of bodies that were involved. The State Board of Education, the Industrial Instructional Quality Commission, the History Social Science Subcommittee of the Instructional Quality Commission. They then appointed framework authors, which were outsourced somewhat to a body called CHSSP at UC Davis. They created these IMR CRE panels. There were others behind the scenes that were involved that were never made public, even though that's illegal. Um, There were the publishers who were working in parallel As a community, we provided public oral testimony and public written comment in thousands of letters and and statements. At the end of it, 
something happened, but by and large, we'll, we'll talk about what happened, but, but think about the bureaucracy. This is government bureaucracy. That's no different anywhere in the world, but it's the most bureaucratic in California because we spend the money to make it that bureaucratic, which also means to change it, we have to engage all of these bodies. Now, if you went to CHSSP at UC Davis in 2015, you were way too late. You should have been engaging in 2010. The framework authors did their work. And then we came in in 2015 at the history social science subcommittee level, as did many others from the community. Now, in after 2020, the process was handed over to roughly 1,100 districts who were then engaged in the process of adoption. That process is still going and will continue through next year. Now, when you look at these districts, there are 1,100 school boards in California alone. That means 1,100 superintendents of education and 1,100 subcommittees and 1,100 different processes. We have to engage in all of that for anyone that gets through this complicated process in the middle, which is at the California state board level. Now, this wasn't something we had mapped out at the beginning. We, we stumbled through this process like the rest of the community, but we did map it out towards the end to make sure that when we engage the next time, we would do so in a more systematic manner. And so when we talk about accomplishments, I want to be very, very clear. We should celebrate our wins, but we should remember that the glass isn't completely full. We didn't win. Now, we didn't lose either, and we made steps forward but we didn't win in an absolute sense. And so if we look at California gives us a stick to wield and we used it at the framework level and at the textbook level. And the stick that it uniquely gives us in this country, it's the only state that does, is that in the legislature, there is an education code and it specifically states educational materials should not stereotype adversely to reflect, demean or ridicule religious beliefs. It should also not promote religious and, oh, sorry, it should promote religious and cultural diversity, instill a sense of pride in one's religion, eradicate roots of prejudice, and help develop a feeling of self worth. Great. We all thought, let's leverage this. And we did. And we'll see what happened. We went through this process at the state board level. And there were hits and misses, and the controversy that I'm sure everyone is aware of, of India versus Hinduism happened. There were a number of meetings that happened in the front, and by and large, we lost. At that point, Kundan did submit a very, very strong letter, which I'll quote. In the framework, Hinduism is discussed between these pages and between these lines. And of them, um, they discussed the issue of caste, which basically leaves 15 lines dedicated to other issues. Um, and then they overemphasize caste, essentializing the conflation of Hinduism with caste and limiting the portrayal of Hinduism and narrowing its expanse because everything was caste centric. In other words, frame, the framework singles out Hinduism, exposing its adherence, our kids, to ridicule and subtly portrays it to be inferior. In the contemporary world, no kid wants to be associated with such a belief. So in other words, if we're hierarchical and oppressive, you're directly impacting a kid's belief in his religion. And so Hinduism is, because it's presented as inherently hierarchical and oppressive, and is not a ma matter of considerable academic debate, singling it out for these negative portrayals tantama is tantamount to prejudice and discrimination. It's time for them to wake up. This is one of the largest, most important letters that were submitted. And what we know at the end of this, and we'll go into it again, was there was a significant impact behind the scenes between the final hearing with the IQC and um, on the framework and what was eventually published as the framework after the process was complete and we moved into the textbook round. She was a commissioner in the instructional uh, IQC, Instructional Quality Commission, Subcommittee on India and Hinduism. Sorry, Subcommittee on the History Social Science um, the History Social Science Subcommittee. And after a very long pause, um, and just, just a little more context, there are a bunch of commissioners, there are eight or nine in number, and it's largely an echo chamber. No one likes to raise their voice, and when they do, everyone else can, tends, tends to agree. That's just the nature of how this body works, as we saw over the last couple of years prior to this. So she takes a long pause, a deep breath in, and then she says, 
The only other thing I would like to bring to the committee, and this is with regards to the discussion on Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, is that I would like to cite two of the documents in public comment after reviewing public comment associated with this program. And then for document 929, named 9-25 by Hindupedia, this was the second one, number one, page 31 to 51 of these documents listing 37 recommended edits and corrections. And of those, 1 through 16 and 21 to 57 are recommended. If you actually open that letter, none of those are actually edits and, and corrections because we weren't asked to submit edits and corrections. The way the process worked was we were asked to support or reject the set of materials. Now, these comments that, that she is specifically recommending all commented and asked for the rejection of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt's two programs that they had submitted. And for context, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt is the largest publisher of children's instructional materials in the US. And as a consequence of her standing up and being willing to support us after engagement with her over the preceding year, it resulted in everyone else saying, okay, with the exception of Bill Honig, who was the chair, who pushed back explicitly hard saying, well, what about one textbook? What about one year instead of the rest? And he tried very hard to rescue it. And it was explicit. But at the end of the day, we got agreement from the other commissioners agreeing to reject Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Now, the way this works is the subcommittee makes a recommendation. They don't actually reject anybody. That subcommittee goes to the full Instructional Quality Commission, who makes a recommendation to the state board, who then accepts that recommendation at the state board, and then it becomes official. But, but this meeting at this subcommittee was key to that rejection. Houghton Mifflin Harcourt had roughly 50% market share in California. Now, Kundan made a number of quotes from McGraw-Hill's textbooks that, approved, that were approved coming out of this process. They're egregious, as you saw. And, and so when we talk about glass half full, glass half empty, yes, we got the biggest publisher rejected. The second largest went through with barely a scratch and all of the key horrendous tenants in place. So what happened? In the framework, at the end, after it got approved, Kundan submitted his letter and what got published, there was a 50% reduction in the Hinduism caste hierarchy oppression discourse. The state were rejected Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, yay. Um, they not, not only got rejected in the middle school, they got rejected in K through eight in California. Two programs for eight years, only three, two of which years impact India and Hinduism until 2028, caused a 14% drop in their market capitalization. They're a public company, remember. So, so significant revenue impact, they had roughly 50% share. Um, our ongoing work outside, we worked with Discovery in the process. We continued engaging with them. And I believe we played a key role in them exiting the history social sciences business altogether. So we won a couple additional market share points, Yeah. right? Now, however, the state standards aren't changed. The framework is still Hindu Dveshi. All the other textbooks yeah. are terrible. And McGraw-Hill, the second largest publisher in the US and the second largest in California is by and large win winning the market share that Hot Mifflin Harcourt got, had to evacuate. Pearson was somewhat better and TCI is the least bad. And guess what? The entire market is going to these three. Now, we're talking about California. But, but one thing through our engagement with publishers we learned, and we suspected beforehand, but we learned, is that they don't produce books for California. They produce books for the U.S. And those books adopt and adhere to California standards where California defines them. Similarly, in the sciences where Texas has an issue, they create books that adhere to Texas. And they put that in something that's a compendium for each of these topics. When it's in this compendium, when they go to another state, if the state doesn't have something that says, don't do this, that California requires, they get the thing that was produced in California. They don't want to produce these materials twice. And as a consequence, these books that are approved in California are making their way right now through all of the other states in the US. So we didn't stop there. 
coming out of that um, the process because McGraw Hill was so egregious. We produced the work "Making Children Hindu Phobic: A Critical Review of McGraw Hill's World History Textbooks." Keep in mind, these are textbooks that are approved in California for grade six and seven. Which are covered in other states in grade six or grade seven or grade eight or nine or ten. We look through a large number of states' requirements. There is no social history, social science framework in any other state. Their standards are more general than those that California requires, almost as a rule. If I'm off by maybe one by a line, then that may be the case. But from everyone that we saw, in order to properly engage. With these publishers, we had to create an alternate history social science framework, specifically on the chapters that relate to Hinduism and in India, and we did that under the constraints that had to largely fit within the construct and the topics that California required. So, where we would have wanted to introduce new topics, we refrained. It wasn't perfect, but but we believed it would be close enough to the California framework that it would be acceptable in California. Far enough away that it would no longer be Hindu Dwishi. That was signed by eleven history social science academics, six scholars in history social sciences, and non-history social science academics, five academic and scholarly organizations, three sampradays, and seven social and cultural organizations. All in, those signatories represented more than one million Hindus residing in the U.S., and of course, tens of millions when you look at their global following. A lot of these numbers are driven by the three sampradays, although there is one very large social and cultural organization that signed as well. Did we get all the sampradays? No. Did it take a long time? Yes. Now, how many documents have been produced by anyone that are signed by three sampradays? In the U.S., I'd be challenged to push for one. Maybe there is one, but but this endeavor took almost a year to happen. Between creating the document, actually, the creating the document was the easy part, and that took six months, if I remember correctly,、um, and the signatory process, which took nine months. So we overlapped by about three because we had reviews、uh, where they got to present their feedback, and, and that got incorporated to make sure we went together and move forward as a community. Krishna, you would also want to、uh, tell people that、um, this book is available on Amazon, and the Kindle version is free. Yeah, and the other thing I will add is this: the reason we made this book available freely is because we wanted to enable others.、Yeah. Right, Hindupedia's mission, by and large, is academic and educational to fix the academic system, and we were hoping people would take inspiration. And we were surprised when when people did. This was useful in Massachusetts. I've heard that it's being used by activists in、um, other states as well. They're limited in number, but we did make make progress. So, are we done? No, unfortunately. This is a long-standing effort. Since the close of the California process, we've reached out to 1,100 California school districts and realized exactly how hard it is. We've made some progress, but but very very limited. We met with the Indian Prime Minister's office through multiple meetings, made some progress, but but very little.、Um, I talked about the influence in several states in the academic front. We presented at eight conferences, made five invitational lectures, published three chapters in three different books, and one article. This work will continue to happen,、um, and so this this is not something we're done with by any means. You heard at great length from、uh, these two、uh, scholars about what happened in California case. Obviously, the message you get is it's it is a tough fight. It's very complicated. It requires a lot of a、uh, lot of things to happen. But you know, ultimately, we achieved.、Um, I'd say more than partial success. Although、uh, some Hindu Deshi content is still out there, and and this work will、uh, never quite stop. So, is this something that? We can effectively fight as a community、uh, on a sustained basis. I mean, the answer has to be yes, clearly. Just take yourself back to 9/11, and you would you would have said the Muslim community in this in this country is going to be really in a bad shape as a result of that you know major traumatic event. And yet, 20 years later, they are in a 
in a very comfortable position as a matter of fact they probably put us hindus on a on a back foot on in many of the areas so clearly it is possible with the right kind of determination and resources it is possible to change the narrative in the society and uh, i think this slide basically says it all you know life is like making sausages you pretty much get what you put into it so uh, this this conversation tonight is not about fundraising but we do have to as a community we do have to have a mature conversation about about money and about resources so on that i just wanted to share what are the charitable giving practices of different faith groups this uh, chart here shows what i know of the prescribed practices of different faith groups so christian christians they are supposed to contribute 10% of their annual income the term is called tith and it's prescribed as, i mean it's, it's supposed to be mandatory uh, what percentage of people actually give 10% is open to question interestingly enough uh, the african american contribution uh, according to government figures reaches almost 8% so so it's uh, you know 10% is not an outlandish figure now the jewish community also has the tith system also 10% of the annual income but it's not mandatory and yet we know that jewish community is very effective in in the in the public square so there is there is a lot of money that's that's coming from the jewish community at large towards this kind of issue now islam has a system called zakat it's supposed to be 2 and a half percent and yes it's supposed to be mandatory and when i say mandatory it's within quotation marks some people give less some people give lot more but uh, there is there is a system of giving that's prescribed in the faith hindus um, uh, we don't have a prescription per se and of course nothing is mandatory but we do have a have a long tradition of giving but let's look at some figures this is based on 2017 2018 uh, some published data from government so you know us government sources the data i have is that the average american household contributes a uh, little over $2500 a year per household whereas the hindu american household contributes roughly 2000 a year now that doesn't look terribly out in terms of magnitude but when you look at on a different scale the percentage of annual income the american household contribution comes out to about 4% of the annual income whereas the hindu household in, uh, contribution comes out to only about 2% and uh, it rests on the fact that uh, hindu americans the average household income is almost twice as much as that of the national average so that's a pretty big uh, that's a pretty big gap that gap represents roughly 2 billion dollars in 2017 18 dollars if you look at the income today that number would be significantly larger than the 2 billion that's one area where i think hindu community at large needs to think about uh, upping their game the other thing is uh, a great deal of our hindu contribution goes to uh, goes towards uh, religious places uh, mandirs i'm not against temples by any stretch of the imagination i think uh, you know we need temples they they do a great job but we need to find a way to engage them in social dialogue in in helping with education in helping with carrying on the dialogue about how you know about hindu dwesha and how to how to counter hindu dwesha